Hello, I'm Dr. Claire Johnson. I'm a lifelong lucid dreamer and the first person to do a PhD on lucid dreaming and creativity. Lucid dreams are dreams where you know that you're dreaming. You can guide and shape the dream if you want to. And I'm here today with the man who started it all with respect to the scientific exploration of lucid dreaming. This is Dr. Keith Hearn. And 40 years ago, in 1975, his pioneering experiment proved that lucid dreaming was an actual phenomenon of sleep. Can you believe that it's been 40 years since you were hovering over that polygraph machine? It, it seems longer. I think sometimes it, it was 1875, but <laughs> there we are. What happened was that um, I gone to Hull University and there was a sleep laboratory there. And I thought that was wonderful. I started doing some experiments. I'd heard about lucid dreams that you've described. The trouble is, no one could say where a lucid dream happened in the night, uh, because there's no evidence. When you're dreaming in REM sleep, so-called, the body is absolutely paralyzed. It has to be. Otherwise, when we were living in the trees, we would have fallen out, not survive. Anyway, so my problem is how on earth do I get people to signal in some way from within a lucid dream? I tried micro switches and all sorts of uh, strange methods. But anyway, then it occurred to me one day that, wait a minute, this is called rapid eye movement sleep. The eyes are not inhibited, well, the rest of the body is profoundly paralyzed. So I instructed a lucid dreaming person to make about eight left to right eye movements on becoming lucid. And I knew it would either work or not work at all, so it was with some trepidation that I set a wired the subject up. And for the first few REM periods, they come periodically every 90 minutes or so, nothing was happening. And I was watching the recording for these a bit frustrating. Anyway, <clears throat> getting towards eight o'clock in the morning, the subject was in indubitable stage REM sleep, very clear, very obvious. And there was a, a sort of long burst of random eye movements. And then suddenly, this sequence of eye movements came out, in fact, like this. Yes. Quite amazing, isn't it? That this never happens. You never see this in the sleep laboratory right. uh, normally. Uh, indubitable stage ram sleep. The subject about here realized he was dreaming, and I think he was walking around the university in the, the dream, as vivid as anything. And then he, so he made his eye movements and continued with his dream. And I was spellbound. I could not believe it. This is someone who was in another room, asleep, unconscious, you might say, in his own universe, thinking clearly, signaling to me in my universe. It was not a spooky thing. It was absolutely astounding, and it makes me shiver a bit, you know, to say shake the word time, as I talk about it now, you know. So that was my discovery. And a marvellous one, it was. Because well, back in those days, that. well, welcome. Back in those days, scientists refused to believe in the existence of lucid dreaming. A lot of people didn't believe that they existed, a lot of academic colleagues. Yeah. Sort of, sort of huffily said, well, no, they, they, these things don't exist. You know. Um, this is the problem in science about thinking that your experiences are the only ones worthwhile and everyone else is wrong. That was the attitude about it. But I did listen to ordinary people, not scientists with their theories. Um, it's just ordinary people. Yes, I have those dreams. Yes. They are genuine dreams. And I can do this and do that and control the dreams and yes. so on. Consistent mm -hmm. information. And some people have very many lucid dreams. I mean, Alan Worsley, who made those eye signals, he, he was a very talented lucid dreamer. Well, he had one about every seven days. Some people have them each night. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in fact, when I was doing the research, 
it was so inefficient because I had to wait up all night for one lucid dream, say, yeah. for a few minutes. I had thoughts about inventing a device. Necessity is the mother of invention, you know. Mm -hmm. And as I was sort of languishing there, I think, oh God, when's this next lucid dream going to occur? I realized that in a, when you become lucid, normally it's a case of recognizing an anomaly. That's like you true. find you're speaking to someone who's dead in reality. Or you're floating, you're doing something yes, out of the ordinary. That yes. is so correct. So I thought well, maybe I could introduce an artificial anomaly into the dream. Mm -hmm. I tried all sorts of eccentric uh, ways. The most eccentric was when I would creep into the bedroom with an exotic perfume and put it under the nose of the dream, yeah? so, and hoping that would trigger lucidity. Yes. But it didn't work. All that <laughs> happened that in the morning, I would go home on the bus in Liverpool, smelling rather of Chanel number no. five. <laughs> so, it was hazardous research, I think. <laughs> well, I know that um, Derve de Saint-Denis, who wrote this, the first book really on lucid dreaming in Western society, yes. he tried that as well with perfumes to uh, evoke a yes. sense of place and then become that lucid. Right, yes. He sort of like by conditioning technique. Yeah. He went on a holiday and with a little perfume, he'd have his servant spray around it him for some time. Then months later, the servant went to his room and sprayed the, uh, the same perfume, and it did apparently evoke memories exactly. of, of the holiday. Yes. Especially well. if you're expecting the trigger, you know, then it, you, you're ready, you're primed for it yeah. anyway, and expectation is such an important part of becoming Perhaps lucid. Perhaps everyone can do that anyway, you're going yeah. on a lovely holiday, say to Venice, you're a particular Venetian-like sort of perfume, mm. and then this could be introduced later on by someone and this could revive wonderful memories. Because it really does. Smell is so evocative, yes. isn't it? Yeah. So and there's so, yes. lots of things that people can uh, utilize here. Yeah. And of course, you invented the, the dream machine, was that's the first right. um, device to trigger lucidity. Well, that's, that's because um, there's inefficiency in uh, the work. So I tried uh, perfumes and other things. Then it occurred to me, wait a minute, what about electrical pulses. Someone in America had actually given pulses to the wrist just to see what happened. There's no yeah. attempt to induce lucidity. And they said they could be directly introduced into the dream or indirectly. The, the person might dream that a dog is biting their wrist. Right, exactly. Symbolic. So I thought, well, I'm going to try that. But I needed a dream detector because we're not dreaming all through the night. It's only sort of 90 minutes or so. So but that was actually the more difficult part of uh, the, the discovery. Um, eventually, I found that breathing rate increases. It sort of doubles from 10 breaths a minute in so slow sleep to about 20 yeah. in REM sleep. So that is actually a very good dream detector. Then I combined that with the method of giving pulses, and that constituted an inventive step. Uh, so I, I got a patent out on that. A problem was that we are all so different, and the biggest thing I've learned in psychology is the concept of individual differences. Yeah. So I could hardly sew one of those for price of a washing machine or something when it wouldn't work on some people. Exactly. And yeah. it, but it would work all right on other people. So that didn't actually get anywhere practically. But I've got some ideas for the future. Well, I remember the first time that you and I met properly was uh, when we went to the Science Museum in yeah. London uh, so that I could see your dream machine and, and we could uh, talk. And that's when we realised that we not only share this, um, this passion for lucid dreaming, but also yeah. we have a deep interest in rockets? The healing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we saw the space rockets. Oh, you said you'd go on a space trip oh, to, yeah. to Mars if one came up. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, yes, in, in the healing power of the unconscious. Yes. And of course, you work with this as um, a yes, I Yes, I've set up a, a college for training hypnotherapists. I've been doing this for donkey's years. I find it very rewarding sort of uh, work. 
Uh, for instance, just to give you an example, uh, one woman came to me and she'd been trying to have a, a baby for years and she spent a lot of money on IVF and so on. But uh, I simply communicated with her unconscious. There's a method of doing it with what's called idiomotor responses, slight finger movements that can be yeah. monitored. And I actually asked her unconscious, Am I right in thinking this woman doesn't actually want a baby? Because she was saying anomalous things. And sure enough, the fingers were dancing. Yeah. Her unconscious was blocking, sabotaging the whole procedure, really. So she was, there's no way that it was going to allow her to have a baby because there's so many uh, hurdles at yes. which point they can. And you found out why. You found out what the, the reason was. I did. Why there was this unconscious problem. Now, this was interesting too, because when she was four, I think, her grandmother died. Now, children become very attached to grandparents. And, but the parents tried to be modern parents and say, well, we explain everything to them. They said to the child, look, grandma got something growing in her head and it's making her ill. So the poor girl, all she saw was the grandma getting worse and worse and worse, and then departing this world. So she was that, left with that message. That was the message. It was, uh, and, and these messages are not switched off. They, they seem to go on throughout lifetime. In most of my work, I deal with messages that haven't been switched off. So, so it was that she, the implicit thought was that if you have something growing inside you, you die. You die, yeah. So why get pregnant? Because yes. it will kill you. Yeah. That's right. Crazy, yeah. So it's, it's, but it's, that's it's, how it works. It's yes. just so these things, these messages from the unconscious are so strong, and they affect us in ways that we have no, we have no conscious knowledge of. So that's right. It's only through working with the unconscious through hypnotherapy or through lucid dreaming or dream work that we can unwrap these issues. That's right. In my own uh, case, uh, there's a lot of symbolic uh, imagery in, in dreams. At one point, I had um, pretty bad bronchitis. It, it went on and on, and the antibiotics were not working. And I was getting really weak, incredibly weak. So then I had a dream in which there were two small trees that had no leaves on, just bare sort of thing. And, I was given a, a can of <laughs> insecticide. And I had to spray these trees to kill all the bugs in them. This was, of course, symbolic of my lungs and the um, viruses and so on. So yes. I did. Um, the next day, the next day, I started to feel much better. Yeah. And then I was cured within a, a few days. Again, the healing power of, of the unconscious. Of the illness itself, yes, it, it's quite an amazing thing. Yes, well, it's like, it's very similar. The, the kind of things you can do in lucid dreaming through changing the, the imagery while you're in the dream or working yes. with it to understand it is very similar to the kind of thing you do in hypnotherapy. And as you know, I've been a lucid dreamer all my life, and I've worked with this very deeply. And I've also developed the lucid writing technique, which I've told uh -huh. you about. Now, this is like a waking version of lucid dreaming. And um, an example for exa is of one woman who found this very helpful was when she had a, a terrible nightmare. She, she came to one of my courses, which is a, one of the courses I really enjoy teaching. It involves yoga, artwork, nature, lucid dreaming, and psychological dream work. And she seemed really nervous and kind of tense when she uh, arrived. And she told us all about a nightmare in the dream work session. And in the nightmare, she was in the middle of uh, a terrible electrical storm. She was piloting a tiny plane on her own. And there was another plane in the, in the sky, sort of over there somewhere, but mm. it was nothing to do with her. No one could help her. She was enclosed in this terrible situation. Yeah. The storm got worse and worse, and she knew there was no way she was going to get out of that situation alive. So that was the dream. Now, with lucid writing, we we relax, enter a light trance, and return to the dream, and then see what spontaneously might transform. And um, what happened with her in her lucid writing was she was in this plane again in the sky, struggling, but she knew that things could change. And in fact, the big plane 
helped her. It helped to guide her to oh. safety. Yeah. Um, and so the dream sort of worked out well in the lucid writing. Now for her, this was like, um, it, it, it was a major thing. She cried as she told us about yeah. what, what had happened mm -hmm. because she had had this realization that she'd been going through life with like a victim mentality. Uh, she was being bullied by her boss at work. She felt completely isolated in a very terrible, dangerous, uh, threatening situation. And she felt that there was no help. And now she understood, actually, help is available. She doesn't have to do it alone. And she can get onto safe ground and, and throw off that, that victim mentality. Well, that would have changed her life. That's yeah. how powerful it is. I developed a method of dealing with uh, nightmares. Mm -hmm. I've had, as a sleep researcher, had people contact me who were literally suicidal about their nightmares, which is sh shows how bad they can be. Some people have a sleep a phobia, even, because they, yeah. they know every single night they will have a, a nightmare. And it's usually the same. Well, I. I it dealt with one person because I was on the radio in Liverpool quite a lot talking about my lucid dream research and I mentioned how you can control dreams yeah so a woman uh, wrote to me maybe a week later and she said you have saved my life and I thought well have I done that <laughs> and she said uh, each night every single night for years she'd go to bed and she'd go into a dream where there was a coffin and her husband's body was in the coffin, all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Same dream. And she was terrified of going to sleep. She didn't get much sleep at all. She was really run down and so on. Yeah. Anyway, um, in the dream, she the next time she had it, she remembered what I'd said on the radio. You can control him. And she did. And she made it into a pleasant dream. And it was such a relief. And she said, thereafter, it was OK. That also changed. So it's you wonderful. can actually convert yeah. nightmares to lucid dreams. In fact, it's, exactly. uh, yeah. it's Hearn's portal, you know, <laughs> into lucid dreaming. If you've got lucid dreams, uh, sorry, you've got nightmares, then you have an advantage over other people. Because people are terri they're terrified. It's true, though. Nightmares are like creative gifts as well. Yes. I mean, they, they, they are gifts from the unconscious. No matter how terrifying they are, we, yes. can, we can work with them and you they'll give us some truth. It's, it's, it's giving you a message. It's, yeah. it's a, a portal, as they say. So yes, a portal to lucidity, a portal to waking up to your, your own yeah. life and what's happening in it. Yes. Yeah. So then thereafter, they're waiting, oh, I hope I have a nightmare tonight. You know? <laughs> because they want, what they do is they change their mindset from, oh my God, here's the nightmare. Yeah. Well, that's guaranteed to churn out the nightmare, guaranteed. Because yeah. what you think in a dream, you, you then dream. And this is, this is a concept I've been explaining to my daughter, who's five. Yeah. If you're scared in a scary dream, what happens? It will get scarier. Yeah. So the best thing to do is to calm down, recognize that this is a scary dream image, and then spontaneously decide how you would like to react in that situation. If There's you calm down, the it. dream comes. Yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah. There's a technique that I recommend, that if you're being pursued, pursuit seems to be the main nasty thing yeah. happening it's in very nightmares. Common, that's it. So w w you don't run away, you stop and you turn around and you face the, yeah. first, uh, the monster and you can imagine laser beams coming your f from your fingers. It works well. <laughs> and you zap the monster but this big thing oh, it gives down to nothing yeah. and then with a certain sense of mastery you then direct the dream, what you think you then dream. So if you cover your eyes, you're only dreaming of doing this, you're not really doing it because you're paralyzed. Yeah. And will yourself to say an exotic desert island. You can also meet people of your choice by usually imagining setting up a scene with a door and then thinking behind that door will be some important person mm -hmm. that you'd like to converse with. That's it. And whatever, but, uh, and there they are. And it's so utterly amazing. This is the television yeah. of the future, you know. That's it. Well, and also, I mean, in a nightmare, you could, you can ask for help as well. You could say, behind that door, there's going to be help. I'm opening the door. Someone's going to come yes. in and help me. 
or often I find if there is a nightmare, just the fact of becoming lucid will change the scary nightmare vision. It will, it will shrink down and relax because with lucidity you often, you do release fear because you know, okay, this is a dream, I will wake up safely in my bed and this is, this is something from my unconscious which, is, which has appeared, which is very scary, but I can, I can deal with this. And just that, yeah. just that knowledge, that recognition can actually change the, the scary images so that they'll, they'll perhaps talk to you and you can maybe even befriend yes. them. It, it, the whole situation has turned around. Yeah. Interestingly, from the scientific point of view, there are two kinds of nightmares. There's the REM nightmare, 96% of nightmares are of that variety where there's a beginning and a middle and an end yeah. where you're being throttled or something but <laughs> there is an end um, whereas uh, in slow wave sleep the other kind of sleep which is sort of deep uh, sleep um, there's a type of nightmare and there's, there's no noticeable leading up to it in the polygraphic record mm -hmm. my dream machine it could actually stop nightmares because it detected the person's agitated and they were gently awaken them but it, and so you, there's no sign whatsoever they can be triggered for instance by a noise um, and uh, I've had that, I come across that quite a lot of times a little switch an automatic switch say that you don't notice in the day but at night yeah. it's click yes. <laughs> it can trigger the nightmare um, I did me I did measure one of these in the sleep lab. I monitored it. Um, a, a student came in and she was wired up, put into the, the bedroom. I was in the control room looking at the chart record. And, you know, and she's in slow wave sleep, so I can get on with my work for <laughs> typewriter. Do you remember typewriters? Um, yes. <laughs> you see them in museums, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'd, I'd get on with that. And it was. I looked at the chart, and it was fine. Just ordinary slow wave sleep, no uh, uh, rapid heart rate or anything. So I turned around, got on some work. I had a, an intercom on because I was interested in teeth grinding, sleep Right. Yeah. Suddenly, uh, there was the most horrific, blood curdling scream I've ever <laughs> had, and it was amplified about ten times. Oh no! So uh, I, I almost died. Yeah. The Death in the Sleep Laboratory. That's, that's, it, that's a yeah. title for a what it is. <laughs> Dangerous. Um, and then uh, I looked at the chart record. I was died again because she has no brain waves, no heart rate, nothing. I thought, my God, I've electrocuted her. <laughs> How do I explain this to the professor? This is, this is the end of my academic career. So with some quickness, I dashed into the bedroom. She wasn't even there. I thought, what, what's going on? <laughs> She, I found her behind the door. She jumped out of bed as a result of a sudden uh, sleep terror yeah. or nocturnus. And she pulled off all the electrodes. She, just, she was behind the door? Behind the door. She was a gibbering wreck. Oh. So was I. <laughs> because, oh. Anyway, I calmed her down. Just speaking to a gibberish. Calmed her down. We are academics, so the experiment always comes first. So I shoved her back into bed <laughs> and reattached the electrodes and resumed the experiment. But as usual with the slow wave uh, nightmares that often children have, the Pavel not does, yeah. she had no memory whatsoever yeah, of that. Yeah, they don't, no. do they? Interesting. Amazing. But parents are scared. They drag them to the uh, doctors, well, look, The child doesn't even recognise the parents and gets worse when yeah. the parents yes. are trying to calm them down. It worse. Yeah. The children would grow out of these things anyway. But so, so that was um, a remarkable experience. Yes. <laughs>